Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is the death of a man caused by a woman who was said to be a very close friend of his, but she said that the entire situation was a complete accident. However, there are others out there who think that the whole thing might be a lot more than just an innocent accident, so I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you guys think about this case after hearing the details. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Upside. Inflation has us all thinking about how to cut back, whether it's cutting back on driving, dining out, or buying less at the grocery store. We can all agree that there's nothing fun about less, but now with Upside, you don't have to cut back. You can get cash back on gas, dining out, and your groceries. Upside helps offset inflation by giving you cash back on all of your purchases. It's crazy to me that yogurt that I used to buy for a dollar is now $2.50, and my car, which used to fill up for $25, is now filling up for more than $50. It really stinks having to cut back on essentials that I need, but because of Upside, I no longer have to cut back on essentials or the things that I enjoy getting, those little luxuries in life. Now I can dine out more often with my friends and get my weekly morning Starbucks before work. When compared to credit card or loyalty programs, you can earn three times as much cash back with Upside. You can cash out at any time to your bank account, PayPal, or an e-gift card for Amazon or other brands. To claim your offer on whatever you're buying on Upside, you check in at the business, you pay as usual with a credit or debit card, and you get paid. To get started, you can download the Upside app in the App Store or a Google Play. Then you can use my promo code RACHEL10 and you can get $5 or more cash back when you make a purchase of $10 or more. Once again, that's downloading the Upside app and then using code RACHEL10 to get $5 or more cash back on your first purchase of $10 or more. Thank you so much again to Upside for sponsoring today's video. With all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the death of Henry Jemot. Henry Jemot was born in the town of Dangriga, Belize. Henry grew up in a family with three sisters, so his family lovingly referred to him by the nickname King, since he was the only boy in the family. Even though he was the only son to his parents, he grew up incredibly close with his sisters, especially his older sister, Cherry Gemma. Cherry went on to become a police officer with the Belize Police Department, so Henry decided to follow in her footsteps and become a cop. Henry also went on to marry his wife, Robin, and together the two had five children. At the time of Henry's death, he was 42 years old, and he had worked his way up to being the superintendent of the police. His close friend said that his goal and his dream was to become the police commissioner, and he really thought that he was going to get there one day soon. Henry was loved by everybody around him. Those who worked with him, as well as his close friends, described him as being a kind-hearted protector. Because he grew up surrounded by women, he was a natural protector to those in his life. Then, when he became a dad, this tendency grew. He would do anything in his power to protect those closest to him. He was a no-nonsense type of guy, but he was lovable, friendly, reliable, and overall just a great friend and father. He loved sports, he loved music, and most of all, he adored his family. So now that we've talked a little bit about Henry, let's discuss the other people involved in this case. First, we have to discuss the Ashcroft family. Michael Ashcroft is a billionaire originally from the United Kingdom. He made his fortune by buying and selling various companies, with the most notable being the home security company ADT. He purchased ADT in 1987 and then sold it to Tyco International in 1997 for $6.7 billion. That is how he made his fortune and was able to continue being a billionaire through other purchases and investments. Michael spent some time in Belize while completing his education, and then he returned back to the UK from there. From 1998 to 2000, he served as the Belizean ambassador for the United Nations. He also spent a lot of time and business investing and building wealth in companies in Belize. He holds stocks in multiple big banks, TV stations, and a main port into Belize. Then, from 2005 to 2010, Michael Ashcroft served as the deputy chairman of the Conservative Party House of Lords in the United Kingdom. Lord Michael Ashcroft and his former wife, Wendy, 
went on to have three children together, two sons and a daughter. Fun fact, Michael Ashcroft is also the founder of Crime Stoppers in the UK. He set up Crime Stoppers in 1988 when he realized that members of our society just were not willing to speak with police directly. So, he set up a way for people to contact law enforcement anonymously to help solve these unsolved crimes. Now, one of Michael's children is a man named Andrew Ashcroft. He grew up in Belize and holds dual citizenship between the UK and Belize. According to his hotel's website, he spent 18 years of his career in various banking and real estate investment positions across the Caribbean. As the managing director of the British Caribbean Bank, Andrew helped grow the bank's portfolio from $30 million to $400 million. During his time in this role, he provided financing for a number of major real estate projects for different hotel and condos around Turks and Caicos. During that time, by 2015, Andrew met a woman named Jasmine Harton. Jasmine is from Ontario, Canada. She says that she grew up poor, being one of nine siblings in a small farming community. They were so poor that Jasmine's mother remembers that food was in such short supply that she would have to trick the local donut shop into giving her family pastries so that she could feed her children. Jasmine started high school in Kingston, Ontario, and she wanted to go on to become a dentist. She said that all she wanted to do with her life was to help the less fortunate. So, during this time, Jasmine had an opportunity to go to Belize on a missions trip for dentistry. By 2014, she moved to Belize and she set up shop on an island called Amber Gris. She said that she decided to stay in Belize because basically she was from the cold north and the idea of moving to a very warm tropical climate really enthralled her, which I totally understand. I'm from the Midwest, so moving from there to a very warm state like Arizona, I can definitely see the draw. In Belize, Jasmine worked as a real estate agent from 2015 to 2017. While here, she made her name as a socialite and a party girl. During this time is also when she met Andrew. Andrew was a potential client of hers when she was working in the real estate business. According to Jasmine, she was drawn in to Andrew immediately when she met him because she was intrigued by his confidence. She found him very clever, funny, and witty. Jasmine said that when she did ultimately find out about Andrew's fortune, she was curious, but she didn't love him for his wallet. She was interested in being his partner and building something great with him. She said that with the way she grew up, she would never expect handouts. She was used to working hard and needing to build herself up. By 2016, the two of them were engaged and they had two children together, a set of twins, Charlie and Ella. Now, during this time when Andrew and Jasmine were engaged, Jasmine had met Henry Gemma on the island when they were at brunch. Andrew and Henry had been close friends already at that point, so that is how Jasmine met him and was added to the mix. From there, the three were all very close friends. Henry was known to love Jasmine's cooking and would often join the two of them and their family over at their place for dinners with them. After a year of knowing Henry, he moved back to the mainland in Belize and he continued working as a police officer, but this didn't stop the three of them from continuing on with their friendship. By May 6th of 2021, Andrew and Jasmine stood in front of the press to cut the ribbon on the grand opening of their brand new beachfront boutique hotel. Andrew and Jasmine had been working with the Marriott to open their dream resort in the San Pedro town on the Ambergris Cay. The hotel would be called the Aaliyah Belize. When announcing this hotel, hotelonline.com wrote, quote, the eco-luxury development will be the first ever Marriott International property in the country, upholding the high-quality standards of the brand and dynamic marks of the autograph collection, celebrating the founder's passion, thoughtfulness of design, inherent craft, and connection with the local. This was a big dream of Andrew and Jasmine's that was finally coming to fruition. After this grand opening, things would go back to normal for Jasmine and Andrew, but normal for them was not what they made it look to be to outsiders. Andrew's family thought that the two had a normal and strong relationship together. 
their kids also saw their parents continuing to be loving and supportive of one another. But behind closed doors, the two were having a lot of relationship issues. Now, like I said, the two had been engaged, but they had never went on to get married. The previous year and a half of this relationship had been very rocky. They were living in a five-bedroom beachfront condo in one of their hotels, the Grand Colony Resort, together, but the two were sleeping in separate rooms. They were having a lot of issues that I don't think Jasmine or Andrew have really ever actually gotten into, but Jasmine explained that the two just emotionally were not in a relationship anymore. They were doing things in front of the camera and in front of their kids and in front of Andrew's family to make it seem like they were this strong and together couple, when in reality, Jasmine said that shortly after the hotel's grant opening, they were planning to go to Andrew's family and let them know that they weren't together anymore. But a lot would happen in the weeks following this grand opening. On May 22nd of 2021, Jasmine had been at a party which was located about 70 miles away from where she lived. At this party, there was a situation where a man followed Jasmine into a room and he started being aggressive towards her in a very sexual manner. She said that she had to physically fight the man off of her, but she was able to get away. After this, Jasmine called the man who she referred to as her protector. Henry Jemot. She told him about the situation, and without hesitation, he drove over an hour to come pick her up from the party, and he took her home. On the way home, Jasmine says that Henry told her that she needed to get a gun permit so that she could get a gun to protect herself. So, it was at this point that Jasmine says Henry took out his Glock 17 and showed it to Jasmine so that she could see what it looked like and sort of get a feel for it. At this point, she said that she agreed that she probably should get a gun permit for her own personal protection. Then, in a strange turn of events, after this whole incident, Henry changed his relationship status on Facebook to single after it had shown him being married to his wife for 14 years. We don't really know about the situation. We don't really know what happened or if it has anything to do with Jasmine or him picking her up from that party or anything else. Robin has never really come out to explain the situation. She really doesn't want to talk about anything in this case right now. It's way too fresh and it still is very traumatic for her, so I totally get that, but at this point, we don't really know if they officially separated, why they separated, etc. But what we do know is that right after the situation happened, Henry had texted Jasmine asking her if she could hook him up with a room at the Grand Colony Hotel because he wanted to stay there and blow off some steam. So, of course, helping out a friend, she did just that. So, Henry and one of his friends had checked into the hotel on May 26th, 2021. That same day, Henry called his friend Francisco Panny Arceo, who is a boat captain and a very good friend of Henry's. Panny said that Henry called him as soon as he got onto the island because the two were very close. That night, Henry and his other friend Manny went over to Panny's house for dinner where they arranged to go out fishing that next morning. So, by 9 a.m. on May 27th, 2021, Henry and his other friend Manny and Panny all went out on the boat to go fishing. Panny recalls that on this trip, Henry was his happy, carefree self. He said that Henry put on a happy, carefree face the entire trip. He didn't mention anything about a breakup and he didn't say whether he was upset or whether he was dealing with anything or anything like that. Panny said, quote, he was happy he was catching a lot of fish. He put on a carefree face and he would never talk about problems at home. Real men never do that. He didn't drink on the boat. We came back at 3 p.m. and then he and his friend went off for a shower and drinks. They came back to my house for dinner. I knew they had just had a few drinks. That's what Henry was like. I didn't judge him. When I asked him where he was staying, he said, I'm at Grand Colony. So, his friend said something like, oh, you got money now, and Henry said that he's friends with the Ashcrofts now. So, Panny said, oh, you're with the rich people now, which made Henry laugh. Panny went on to say, quote, we ate the red snapper that we caught earlier that day. He ate every last bit of it and left at 9.15 a.m. Henry was bowing as he went out the front door. He said, thank you, my friend. I will never forget today. 
I had a feeling I would never see him again. Before leaving, Penny said that Henry told him that he had a date that night. When Henry went to make a call in front of his friend, Penny said that he heard a female voice on the other line, so Penny pressed him and asked him who was on the other line, and Henry said, that's my secret, this one I'm taking to the grave. So, on that night, May 27th, Henry had plans to meet up with Andrew, Jasmine, and another friend to get drinks at the Alaya Belize. However, according to Jasmine, Andrew and the other friend bailed at the last minute, so they ended up not coming. So, rather than canceling the plans altogether, Jasmine decided to still meet up with Henry at her condo for a couple of drinks. Jasmine said that she brought a bottle of wine, while I believe Henry brought a bottle of cinnamon whiskey. The two had a couple of drinks together, and Jasmine said that she was just sipping on the whiskey while Henry was taking shots of it. According to Jasmine, Henry never really talked about things in his personal life, but he did mention a few things that night. He mentioned that he was now single after 14 years of marriage. He also said that he was taking a personal leave from work, and this was later confirmed that Henry had taken a personal leave from work to stay at this hotel for a couple of days. But he didn't say anything else beyond that, but once again, he really didn't open up to anybody about anything, so him even telling her this was a pretty good look into what was going on in his life. Now, during this time, there had been a curfew in place due to COVID, but Henry and Jasmine decided to continue their night despite this. Jasmine said that the two had been sitting on her patio and the sky was just beautiful and she wanted to go out and look at the moon. So, they headed over to a dock that was near the condo and they continued drinking and talking and admiring the sky. They were completely alone at this point because, again, there was a curfew in place, so pretty much everybody else was at home inside. But according to Jasmine, as they were leaving the condo, Henry told her that he needed to go ahead and grab his gun off of the kitchen counter where he had left it. She said that this struck her as odd and she asked him why he needed his gun to just go out and talk on the pier, but she said that he told her that he pretty much always had his gun with him. But once again, it still was strange to her because it's not like they were going into town. It's not like they were going very far from the condo. This pier was pretty much right out in front of the condo, so she didn't know why he would need his gun on his person when it was right in the condo right there. But he's a cop, so in my opinion, I totally understand it. So, the two sat down on the dock together. At this point, Jasmine said that Henry looked at her with a very serious look in his eyes. He grabbed his Glock 17 and then took the magazine out and then emptied the magazine of its bullets. At this point, he handed it to her, the empty magazine, and told her to start practicing loading and unloading the magazine. He said that he wanted her to start practicing handling the gun and to get comfortable with loading and unloading it. Jasmine said that after this, after she practiced loading the gun, she handed the magazine back back to Henry, who then took out all of the bullets and placed the bullets on the pier next to him. She said that the bullets were within view, so she could see that the bullets were not in the gun, so she was under the assumption that the gun was empty. So, the first time, he only handed her the magazine, which is a part of the gun, but it obviously can't be shot. It's just the magazine part of the gun. So, she loaded it, handed it back, and then he took all of the bullets out, and then he handed her the gun itself, and then the empty magazine and told her to start, you know, putting the magazine in and dropping the magazine out to practice that as well. After this, as she was doing this, apparently Henry had asked her to massage his shoulders because his shoulders hurt. According to Jasmine, once again, she complied and she did give him a massage. She said that this was nothing weird to her. He saw her as a very close friend and this massage was nothing more than a therapeutic massage for a friend that was in pain. So, a lot of people were saying this could be a sexual thing between them and she says, no, it's just her you know, rubbing someone's shoulders because they were hurting and nothing more. So, she sat at an angle behind him, I believe on the left side of him, and massaged his shoulders. After about a minute or two of this, by 12.45 a.m., Henry told Jasmine that he wanted to head back inside. 
At this point, there are varying accounts of just how intoxicated each one of them was. Obviously, this is coming only from Jasmine's side, so we don't 100% know for sure, but we do know that Jasmine said that Henry was relatively drunk, but not completely inebriated. Jasmine said that she did drink, obviously, but that she was not drunk by any means. She claims that she only had about two glasses of alcohol. She was later asked about why she'd be messing around with a gun at this point in the night with very little light, and she said that she can't really explain it. It was just sort of something that happened in the spur of a moment. So, she said okay about going back inside. She said at this point, he asked her to hand him the clip of the gun so that he could reload the bullet into it. So, she grabbed the gun, which she had set down, and she was still sitting behind him. She said that at this point, she was trying to click the button to get the magazine out, but it was not working. So, she said that because it wasn't working, she sort of held the gun up a little bit closer and used the moonlight to get a closer look at what she was doing. At this point, the barrel of the gun was pointed towards her left, right where Henry was sitting, and at this point, the next thing she knew, as she was fiddling around with the gun, the gun went off. And unfortunately, Henry was hit. She said that after the shot went off, he suddenly fell on top of her. She said that she could feel the warmth of his body, and then she saw blood. At this point, she said that she knew that one of them had been hurt. In that moment, she said that her ears were ringing and she had no idea what happened, so she had to start struggling out from under him to free herself because, again, he's a pretty big guy and she's a pretty small woman, so she really had to struggle to get herself out from under his, you know, just dead body weight. At this point, she said that she had no idea how the gun went off. She doesn't remember pulling the trigger and she thought that the gun was empty. To this day, she continues to hold strong that she did not pull the trigger. There was no way that she pulled the trigger. She does not remember her finger being on it at any point, so she has no idea how the gun could have gone off. As this was happening, as Jasmine was struggling, Henry's body was slipping off of her and into the water. I don't know if I mentioned this earlier, but when they were sitting on the pier, they were sitting on the very edge with their feet dangling off of the side. I don't think I mentioned that, but they were. So, as he was on top of her, as she was struggling to get out, he was sort of sliding down into the water and eventually Jasmine was able to free herself but this meant that Henry fell into the water and was now floating face up. After this, Jasmine was sort of just in a state of panic. She was screaming for help and she ran up to the nearest security guards and asked for them to call the police. When they arrived at around 1.30 to 2 a.m., they found a small, petite, blonde woman who was covered in blood and was pacing back and forth on the pier. They then picked up the gun that was also laying on the pier as Jasmine went to go sit down on some rocks that were nearby. 30 feet away from the shore, they found the body of one of the town's most respected police officers floating face up in the water. He had been shot to death by a single gunshot wound to the back of his head. So, of course, after this, Jasmine was taken into the police station for questioning. When she first spoke with the police, it was reported that her original story had changed. So, the story of what happened and what is accepted is the one that we just discussed. Obviously, though, Jasmine was the only other person at the scene who is still alive to be able to give this information, so this whole situation comes from her. But when Jasmine initially went to go speak with the police, she said that Henry must have been shot by a boat that was passing by. This seemed to be a relatively understandable explanation at first because this area is known to be frequented by drug activity of people making drop-offs in the area. But again, she was covered in blood, there was a gun found laying right there on the pier, so it was obvious that she was not being truthful about this. She went on to say that she also was not drunk or on drugs when all of this occurred. However, when she was taken into police custody, 
a small bag of cocaine was found in her purse. So it was said that when police first got her to the police station, she was completely uncooperative and would not say a word to police until her lawyers were present. But she was actually threatened with drug charges for the cocaine that was found in her purse. So apparently that is when she told the story about the boat passing by. I will say that to this day, she says that she does not remember ever telling this original story because of course she's been asked, you know, why her story has changed since the first time she told it. And she straight up says she didn't say that story about the boat passing by. And if she did, she does not remember saying it at all. So she could have been in a state of shock at this point and really does not remember anything that she said or she could be lying. She also claimed that the cocaine in her purse is not hers. She said, quote, I definitely do not have a drug problem at all, and I will say that the substance that they found was not mine, but when she was asked who it did belong to, she said that she doesn't think she can say. So, what I get from this as well is that, you know, she's trying to say without saying that it's Andrew's or someone in that family's, but she doesn't think she can say. I personally do think that it was hers. I don't think that she'd be carrying around someone else's coke for them. There's no reason for her to be doing so, and if she is, that's her own dumb decision making. I personally think that it is hers. But obviously, if they found coke in her purse after someone shot, it's gonna make her look really bad. I honestly don't know if they ever did a drug test on her or if they, you know, did a blood alcohol reading. I don't know, but I don't think that they did because it hasn't really been reported. In the days that followed the arrest, Jasmine spent 13 days in the Belize prison, which is notoriously known for its horrible conditions. While there, it was reported that Jasmine continued to refuse to cooperate until she could speak with her lawyers. She was being charged with manslaughter by negligence. She stood in front of a judge on June 9th and she maintained that this was a complete accident and that she was innocent. She blamed poor visibility, a potentially damaged magazine, as well as her lack of experience with a firearm. And once again, I will remind you that she is adamant that she did not pull the trigger. She did not put her finger on the trigger. It must have been some sort of malfunctioning with the gun itself. Jasmine's bail was set to $15,000. And after those 13 days in prison, an employee of the Ashcrofts, who was also a friend of Jasmine's, posted her bail. At this point, after she was released, it was clear to Jasmine that Andrew wanted absolutely nothing to do with the situation and nothing to do with her. Once she was released, apparently Andrew had set up a house for her to live in away from him and the kids. According to her, she expected to return home to her common-law husband and her kids, but that just isn't what happened. She said that she was taken into this random house in a random place that she was not familiar with, completely alone and without a cell phone. According to Jasmine, Andrew had told her that he would bring the kids to come visit her as often as he could, but he only ended up bringing them one time. After that, after impatiently waiting to see her kids, Jasmine went over to the Grand Colony herself to go and visit her kids, but that's when things turned very chaotic. She said that security was stopping her from getting inside and that they wouldn't let her see her children. During this entire commotion, apparently Jasmine had also pushed over a hotel employee. Two days later, Jasmine was arrested once again for assaulting a hotel staff member, and at this time, they did also get her for the charge of drug possession. She said that all she tried to do that day was go and collect her personal belongings and see her kids, but Andrew would not let that happen. This also was recorded on video, and if I can find it, I will add that here. So, the friend who had originally posted her bail saw this behavior of her, you know, going to the hotel and pushing over an employee and trying to get in through security, and they thought that she wasn't going to show up for trial because, you know, someone that shows this kind of behavior is probably not the most responsible person and probably won't accept responsibility for their actions, so they didn't think that she was going to show up for trial. So, he revoked her bail and she was sent back to jail for another four days 
before her bail was posted once again by another friend. After being released again, she now had to check in with the jail staff in person once a day, which was around a four-hour drive away from where she was staying. Then, Andrew filed for full custody of their children. Andrew's allegations are as follows. For the reason that the mother of the children hardly spends any time with the children, Andrew Ashcroft seeks full custody of his children because Jasmine is charged with causing the death of a police officer by negligence, as well as the assault of a hotel employee, and claims that she is addicted to non-prescription and illegal drugs and a habitual drunkard. In addition to this, Jasmine said that she has been completely cut off from the Ashcroft family, both like physically and emotionally, as well as financially. She also says that the allegations that Andrew is making are complete lies. The fact that she doesn't spend time with her children is because Andrew physically won't let her, according to her. She, again, denies that she ever did cocaine. She denies that she drinks very often, things like that. She said pretty much everything that he's saying just is not true. So, for the time being, the Ashcroft family stayed out of the media. They didn't make any statements or take any interviews. This entire situation was a public relations nightmare for them. They dealt with the custody battle between Andrew and Jasmine behind closed doors and stayed out of the eye of the public for quite some time. This was until May 19th of 2022, when Jasmine was accused of ordering an assassination hit on the Belizean Commissioner of Police, who was overseeing her custody case. It was rumored that she was trying to hire a Belizean street gang to take him out, so because of this, she was arrested once again on May 19th. So, apparently, this information came from Jasmine's former security guard, a man named Lionel Neal. I don't know if this entire situation is confirmed, but I was able to find it across a couple of different articles. I don't know where exactly this information originally came from, though, but I will talk about it anyways. So, on May 17th, two days before her arrest, Jasmine claims that Neil, who was still her security guard at the time, tried to rape her and blackmail her. Apparently, he had broken into her home and into her room and attempted to rape her. She fought him off and obviously fired him as her security officer, but allegedly he said that if she called the police about this, that he was going to lie to the police about her unless she paid him money. So, when she did call the police and he was arrested, he completely denied that he had ever tried raping her. Instead, he said that the two were having a completely consensual relationship together. He told the police that at some point, he overheard Jasmine talking to somebody else and told this person that the commissioner of the police was going to die. So, this started the rumor about her apparently trying to hire a hitman to kill the commissioner of the police, and again, this is what caused her to be arrested. I guess it was found that these statements were completely false. I, again, I don't know how it was found out, but he was ultimately charged with burglary and attempted rape before he posted bail. Then, by May 20th, Jasmine also posted bail after her new lawyer, Dickie Bradley, had bailed her out. Bradley said that he was astounded that the police would believe an accused rapist and called the allegations preposterous. Jasmine's family was also outraged. They blamed the media for their one-sided reporting since, you know, her ex-husband's family is so very powerful. They control a lot of Belize's economy, so Jasmine and her family claim that they're able to control the narrative and are making Jasmine out to be a complete villain. Then, by May 25th of 2022, Jasmine did lose the custody battle of her now five year old twins. Andrew was awarded sole custody of the children, and since then, he and the children moved to Turks and Caicos. As of right now, Jasmine is still in Belize awaiting her trial. As of right now, I believe her trial date is set for April of 2023 after being moved back a couple of times. So, at the end of this case, there is still so much to discuss. So, there's a lot of people out there, especially Henry's family members, who believe that this was no accident at all. 
One of his sisters says that she believes that Jasmine shot him point blank in the head, execution style. Others have said that they believe that Jasmine lured him to the pier so that Andrew could then come out and shoot him for whatever reason. Others outside of Henry and Jasmine's families believe that there was some sort of affair going on between Jasmine and Henry, and this seems to be like the biggest rumor or thought surrounding this case. So, maybe this was happening. Maybe they were having some sort of affair and something happened where, you know, Jasmine didn't want him to expose this to everybody that they knew. Maybe him being listed as single was because of the affair. Maybe his wife found out. Maybe he told his wife that, you know, Jasmine and her husband were about to get a divorce, so he broke up with her so that he could be with Jasmine. There's any number of ways this could have gone. He did call her a date that night to his friend, so he could have saw her that way. There's any number of ways this could have gone. But maybe after this, after she found out, like, you're giving up a lot in your life to be with me and I don't want it to be that serious. I thought that this was just a casual thing. You know, I'm not gonna leave my husband for you. We're getting a divorce, but I didn't plan on being with you outside of, you know, this casual thing. And maybe she was afraid that he would expose what they were doing, so that is why she shot him. Maybe that night when they had, you know, gotten a little bit drunk, they were talking to each other and he let it slip that, you know, he wanted more from her and she she didn't want that and in a state of panic, she shot him because of that. I will say that Jasmine did address the date thing. She was, of course, asked about this and she said that she has no idea why, you know, he would have referred to her as a date. She doesn't know if that's even true, but obviously it's reported by his friend that he did call her that. So, she said that if he was referring to her, she has no idea why. Some people have also speculated that maybe, you know, he made a pass on her and tried sexually assaulting her that night and she shot him out of self-defense. To me, I don't think that that even really makes sense, the fact that he was shot in the back of the head. The fact that he was shot in the back of the head shows that she was behind him when she did this. I think it was the lower left side of his head, so I don't see a situation where she, you know, would be sexually assaulted and she would go around and shoot him in the back of the head. I guess it could happen, but it kind of leaves a, you know, chance for her to get shot if she, you know, pointed it at herself through him. I don't really know, but I don't really think that's a situation. Jasmine does deny all of these claims. She said that it's not true at all. She said that they were great friends and she is so devastated by all of this. He would never make a pass at her. He would never sexually assault her or anything like that. I agree. I don't think he would. I think being a cop, he has way too much to lose, but I will say that the fact that he drove an hour to pick her up from this party, the fact that they were hanging out alone, the fact that all of these different things occurred, the fact that they were so close, I think that maybe Henry thought that there was more to their relationship and maybe Jasmine just didn't see it that way. Maybe they weren't having an affair, but the fact that, you know, she called him first when she needed help gave Henry this idea that, you know, maybe Jasmine does want to be with me because, you know, she is a beautiful woman and I could see that her being very close to him could give him the idea that maybe she wants more even if she didn't. It was said that, you know, this relationship between a woman who is a part of this billionaire family and then this cop who comes from, you know, pretty much nothing, this is a relationship that, you know, shouldn't exist according to what some people have said. So, it's an uneven power dynamic, so it's thought that maybe he really wanted to be a part of this. Maybe he really wanted to be a part of this rich family, and he thought that Jasmine was the way there. Or, I personally think that he probably just liked Jasmine as a person. I think he might have joked to his friends about how much money she had, but I do genuinely think that he liked them as a people, as a family, and that they had a genuine friendship and that this wasn't about money. So, what I'm trying to say is if there was any sort of affair or if there was any one-sided feelings on Henry's side, I think it was genuine 
a genuine connection that he had with her. But either way, once again, Jasmine completely denies all of these rumors and she said that the rumors are just making everything so much worse because, you know, obviously she's so devastated. They were very close friends and the fact that he's gone is just traumatic for her. So, this is all just making it a lot worse for her. Other people have suggested that maybe the two were using heavy drugs and alcohol that night. Now, I will say that a lot of the reporting on this case overall does seem biased to me. Some articles make Jasmine out to be this angel who came from nothing and who is just trying to build a life with her husband and be a mother and, you know, be a businesswoman at the same time and she could never do anything wrong and that these rumors about her being a party girl and doing cocaine just are not true. Then I see some articles who make Henry out to be, you know, this man who's dealing with his own demons demons and, you know, he has a lot of these internal issues that no one else really knows about that he's dealing with on his own. And then I've seen other articles that make Jasmine out to be this big party girl who's now in her 30s and is still doing cocaine and blacking out and, you know, going out to these crazy parties and dancing on the rafters. Obviously, I don't know any of the people involved in this case, so I don't want to make any snap judgments against anybody, but I will say that you know, I'm trying my best to stay neutral. Some things are being said about certain people and about others. I think sometimes they come from a small bit of truth and sometimes they're complete lies or sometimes it's the full truth. So, we have to keep that in mind as we go through. Again, I'm trying to stay unbiased because I don't want to just assume that Jasmine's this crazy party girl that she says she's not, but I also don't just want to take what she's saying at face value because she's the one being scrutinized. She's the one being looked at. Of course, she's going to say whatever she can to make herself in the best light. So, we have to keep that in mind as we're going through. We also have to keep in mind that while Henry is is the victim here. Maybe he wasn't the perfect person. Maybe there were other things going on that we just don't know about. So, that's what brings me to this next part. So, I didn't mention this in the beginning of the video when we were talking about the whole situation because I did only see it mentioned in one or two articles. So, take this with a grain of salt. But if it is true, I do want to include it just in case because it is very important and it can shed a new light on things. I did see that on the night of Henry's death, when he left his friend's house panties, it was said that he was actually pretty drunk, like inebriated. He then said that as he was driving to the hotel, he was swerving in the road so bad that a cop had pulled him over. So, when he was pulled over, the cop apparently said that he seemed absolutely inebriated and that, you know, he could smell liquor on Henry, but he let him go home anyways, let him drive, and clearly he did make it back to the hotel. This article also says an anonymous person came forward to say that Henry actually dealt himself with heavy alcohol and cocaine use. They said that while he presented himself to the police force to be this person who, you know, followed the law and did everything he was supposed to, in reality, he had his own demons where he was dealing with alcohol and cocaine abuse. So, if he truly was drunk and he truly was on drugs, then it could explain why he was so irresponsible with his gun that night. But Jasmine, who's the one who's trying to do damage control, who's trying to make herself look better in the situation, she said herself that Henry didn't seem inebriated. He didn't seem to the point of blacking out or anything like that. So, I'm not really sure what to make of that article. But others did say that Henry absolutely would never allow anybody else to use his gun. One of his best friends, who he had been friends with since he was six years old, said that Henry has never once allowed him to touch his gun. Never once has he ever thought that it was necessary to teach anybody else how to use his gun, especially in a setting like that. His family all said that he was very, very responsible and that they do not think that he willingly handed his gun over to her. But again, we do have to keep in mind that while Jasmine was a friend to Henry, he could have saw her as more than that. So maybe, 
that's why he made this bad decision or maybe he didn't maybe there is more to this i'm just trying to play devil's advocate and be very fair and unbiased here then on the other hand going along with all of this we have people who simply do not believe jasmine's account of the story they do not think that this was an accident so the program the first 48 brought in a firearms expert named david katz to discuss this he said that a glock 17 is actually very very safe you can bump it around, you can drop it, you can jostle it around without accidentally firing it. There's no possible way that this gun is going to go off unless you pull the trigger. However, there is one exception to how this gun could accidentally go off. It only takes about five pounds of force pressure to pull the trigger on a Glock, which is not a lot at all. As somebody who has personally handled and fired a Glock, I do admit that the magazine release is in a spot that just does not work for me, which is why I don't own one. So where it's located is if your hand is on, so like if this is the handle of the gun and your hand is here and you're shooting it, the button to release is about right here where your hand would press on it, or at least that's where my hand presses on it. So there's been a few times where I'm shooting a Glock and I accidentally squeeze it in the wrong place and the magazine just drops out because I accidentally squeezed the button. Then when I'm trying to actually hit the button like with my hand to release the magazine, I find that very, very difficult. It's so hard for my hands to push that button in on purpose. So I do understand that the magazine release can be accidentally released because I've done it myself, but I also understand that when I'm trying to, like when I'm actually putting the effort to do it, Sometimes it's impossible. Sometimes I cannot get it to release. Now, some people might laugh at me and say, it's really not that hard. You know, if you have more experience with guns, you know, it shouldn't be that difficult. But I'm a woman and I have baby hands. <laughs> so as a woman who has tiny hands, I don't have the strongest hands, but I do know how a Glock works. I do understand how difficult it can be to release the magazine and knowing that I've accidentally released it while shooting it, I know how close that button is to the trigger. I can definitely see how someone with smaller hands who is, you know, a smaller person and who is a woman can have trouble getting that magazine to release because I know men in my comments might be like, it's not that hard, just press the button, you know, just do it. You're not gonna accidentally squeeze it. Never happened that to me before, but it's happened to me before, so just putting that out there. So if it hasn't happened to you, you're lucky. But either way, I could definitely see that if you are a extremely irresponsible person and you have your finger on the trigger while you're messing around with the magazine and trying to get it out, I can definitely see how squeezing your hand can also cause your finger to bend. You can try it right now. When you bend your hand, your finger wants to bend to a certain point. I'm like not exaggerating. When I bend and squeeze my hand, your your finger just naturally wants to bend with the rest of your hand. That's just how the anatomy of your hand works. So if your finger is on the trigger and you are trying to get the magazine release to come out at the same time, whether it's here and you're pushing with your thumb or it's here with the one hand and then the other hand is trying to get it out, I can definitely see if your finger is on the trigger, how squeezing it really hard could make your finger pull the trigger. But to play devil's advocate here, once again, there are videos out there of Jasmine very clearly handling long rifle guns. She was questioned about this, saying that she seems very familiar with guns and how they work since she's clearly used them before. Some people have said that she even looks like a firearm expert. And she did say, yes, she grew up with guns, but she's mostly only ever handled long guns and rifles before, and she's never handled a Glock or a pistol at really any time. So that explains why she doesn't know how to use a Glock, but there's all of these pictures and videos out there of her using rifles. But as somebody who has handled and shot both rifles and pistols, they are very different, but no matter what type of gun you have, the gun rules for handling a gun are always the exact 
same. They are pounded into your head the minute you walk into the gun range, and I know Jasmine's been to a gun range because there are pictures of her at a gun range, and I know it was a controlled environment because it's an indoor gun range. There are outdoor gun ranges that you can kind of just set up yourself where you just go there, you set up your own targets, and you just sort of shoot them. I know she's been to one of those before, but I've also seen her go to an indoor one, and when you walk through the door, they tell you the gun rules. And in the picture of Jasmine with the gun, she is following the gun rules, so I will talk about them right now. So, the first basic rule that everybody who has ever handled a gun should know is that you always treat the gun as if it is loaded. Even if you know it's not possible, even if you know the magazine is completely empty, there always could be one in the chamber and you have to cock back the gun to check to make sure it is or is not in there. And if it is, you dump it out. But the very first gun rule is always treat a gun as if it is loaded even if you took the magazine out, even if you cocked it back and checked, even if you are cleaning your gun and all the parts are apart, you always treat a gun as if it is loaded. That being said, the other rule, you absolutely never point a gun in the direction of another person at any time. You only shoot the barrel of the gun at something that you intend to shoot. Not up in the air, not down at your feet, not over at your dog while you're cleaning your gun, only things that you intend to shoot and are okay with shooting if the gun were to go off. So if you're fiddling around with a gun, whether you're cleaning it or doing whatever or practicing using it, even if it's completely empty, you do not point it at someone next to you, even if it's an accident. If you're fiddling with it and your dog is on the floor and you're pointing it at the dog, you do not do that. Then finally, you never put your finger on that trigger unless you fully intend on pulling it. If your finger is on that trigger when you're holding a gun, you're doing so because you're comfortable with shooting whatever the gun is pointing at. I constantly see pictures of people at gun ranges and they're, you know, posing with their gun and they have their finger right there on the trigger. It just makes me cringe. I cannot stand it. So not to get too far off of the beaten path here, but please don't be one of those people. So being that these are the very basic gun safety rules for everybody who handles a gun, who owns a gun, who goes to the gun range, Jasmine broke every single one of them and we know that. She said herself that she was not too impaired at the time. She drank a little bit, but she was not drunk. At what point are you so inebriated that you completely forget the basic gun rules when handling a gun? If you grow up around guns, your parents are teaching you those gun rules. If you go to a gun range, you are learning those gun rules. At what point do you just suddenly forget every single one of them? I personally had a time where I just did not sleep well. I probably was running on like four hours of sleep. I was exhausted and I definitely was not in the right mindset to be aiming and shooting a gun properly. My target was a complete mess. Trust me, I'm very forgetful when I don't get enough sleep. But I went to the gun range that day because I planned to go with a friend. Even if I was exhausted though, I did not forget the gun rules. Never have I forgotten the gun rules. Never have I pointed a gun at anybody, whether it was an accident or whether it was just me cleaning my gun. Never have I put my finger on the trigger when I'm showing someone my gun or cleaning my gun or fiddling around with the gun. Never have I ever pointed my gun in the direction of another person or any of my pets, not when I'm cleaning my gun, not when I'm showing someone my gun, not when I'm showing somebody how to use my gun. Before somebody even lays a finger on my gun, I tell them the basic safety rules. If they point a gun at me by accident, they are not using my gun ever again. Between a cop and a woman who reportedly, she said herself, she grew up around guns, she has handled them before, who has shot guns multiple times, you want to tell me that neither of these people knew the rules or followed them? Even if Henry was to the point of blacking out and completely, you know, slurring his words and not understanding a word he was saying, Jasmine knows not to point a damn gun in the direction of another person when you're fiddling around with it. You should know to check the chamber for the bullet if you've ever used a gun before. So the fact that she says that this whole thing is blamed on her inexperience and thinking that the gun was empty, I don't buy it. I don't like it and I think that this is just a situation of her being irresponsible. Plus, why was she so adamant about unloading the magazine herself? If she couldn't get it right away, why didn't she just give the gun to Henry and have him drop it and reload it? 
That makes absolutely no sense. Again, if I'm having trouble with my gun, if I can't get it to cock back, or if I can't release the magazine properly, the second I have issues, I'm asking somebody else for help because I don't want a situation to happen, even if I'm in a very safe and controlled environment like an indoor gun range. This whole situation makes absolutely no sense, and obviously you can tell that I'm getting fired up about it because this makes guns look bad. This makes people who own guns look bad, and guns are not bad. If you just know the basic gun safety rules and you follow them like it's your religion, you will not accidentally shoot anybody or anything at any point in your life. So either way, beyond all of that, given what I just said, this leads me to three possible conclusions. Either Jasmine was a lot more drunk than she makes it out to be, or she was high on drugs like cocaine or something like that. And if she was fiddling around with a gun and it went off, that would be reckless manslaughter because, you know, she put herself in a position to allow the gun to go off. She was drunk. She was high. Whether, you know, if she was, I'm not saying she was, but if she was, that would be very irresponsible of her. That would mean that her actions of being drunk and high and fiddling around with a gun led to somebody else's death. Second, it could have gone down exactly how she said it did with Henry telling her to handle the gun, telling her to fiddle around with it and try to figure out, you know, how it works and, you know, the reason she didn't think of any of the gun rules or anything with gun safety is because she was a lot more intoxicated than she wants to say and that's really the only way that I can think that you would forget these gun safety rules that are put in place for a reason, people. They're put in place for a reason. Or, as Henry's family thinks, maybe she killed him maliciously because of a situation that we're just not aware of. Personally, if I'm saying what I think totally candidly, I think this was an accident. I do think the story is a little bit too detailed to be completely fabricated, but they literally found coke on her and she's known around the area for doing coke. Rumors like that usually don't just come out of nowhere. I do think this was an accident, but I think it's because she was being irresponsible. I think she knows more about guns than what she's saying. She's not just this innocent little princess who has never seen a gun in her life and never touched one. Oh my gosh, what is that? That's a gun. Oh, I've never seen that before. I don't think it's as innocent as she's making it out to seem because she has shot guns before and anybody who has shot a gun at least once in their life knows these freaking rules. So, I think she was being irresponsible. I think she either was at a point where she's like, no, I'll get the magazine myself. You don't need to help me. Or, you know, she was just fiddling around with it and was trying to see how it was working and she came up with this story to sort of make sense of it because, you know, maybe he did hand her the gun and said, hey, here's an empty gun. See what you can do with it. And she was just messing around with it and it went off. I think that Again, this was an accident, but because she was being irresponsible. So, I do think that she deserves some time in jail. Do I think she deserves to spend her entire life in jail? No. Do I think she deserves to never see her children again? No. Do I think she deserves to be, you know, arrested for putting out this hit on somebody? I don't think she actually did that. I don't think she's stupid enough to do that. I think that was a situation where the police just sort of do have it out for her because she did shoot somebody that was beloved by the police. So, I do think that that could have been something that police just did to mess around with her, that they believed the story because of how much they hate her. But I don't think that she needs to be tortured for the rest of her life for this. I do think it was an accident, but I think she does need to take responsibility for her actions of being intoxicated and irresponsible. But obviously, again, we don't know for sure. The only person that knows exactly what happened that night is Jasmine, and she's saying she didn't pull that trigger we know that that's not true, so something happened that she's not saying whether she doesn't remember or she's just hiding it. And obviously, everything she says about the situation is going to try to put herself in the best light. She has self-preservation at the core of everything she does and says, so I don't take everything she says for, you know, fact. I take it with a grain of salt, so I think you guys should too. And I think that knowing all of these details, knowing the gun safety rules, knowing everything that I've talked about, about his history, her history, and the entire situation surrounding this, I want you guys to come to your own conclusions and try not to be biased, try not to hate anybody in this video. 
I want you to come to your own conclusions based only on the information that you heard today. I think a lot more is going to come out at the trial, but it's so hard to know what sources to trust and what information to believe just because we do know how rich and powerful the Ashcroft family is and we know that they don't want anything to do with Jasmine, so they're gonna do what they can to separate themselves from her as much as possible. I do truly believe that they do have a foot in controlling what is put out in the media about this. It's clear that they don't want Jasmine to be looked at in a positive light, so once again, look at these articles and these sources with caution. But that is all I have for today's case. I know it might seem like I'm a little bit biased, but I'll say it once, I'll say it a million times, gun rules people. Anyone who breaks the gun rules makes me upset. So I'm not saying that I totally think Jasmine is responsible, that she maliciously killed him. I just think she should have followed these damn rules and if she did, we wouldn't be here today. But either way, that is all I have for today's case. And now I really, really, really wanna know what you guys think. Do you think that this entire thing was an accident? Do you think it played out exactly the way Jasmine said? Do you think that this was a murder or do you think that there's more to the story? Please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to go ahead and turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to download the free Upside app and use code RACHEL10 to get $5 or more on your first purchase of $10 or more. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, I have a new form that you guys can fill out. It's a Google form, so make sure you go ahead and fill that out. I'd prefer that over email, so make sure you fill out that form if you have absolutely any case suggestions. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye!